Lord, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace and your goodness that you have uh, stubbornly, stubbornly shared with us, as we discussed earlier today, your stubborn grace that just does not let up, even though there are times where we stubbornly refuse. But Father, we thank you for being so kind and gracious to us. Another week, another day, another time to come together and worship and Lord, as we, as we sing, as we share, as we study the Word, I pray, O oh Lord, that Jesus Christ would be exalted. And Father, that we would be encouraged. And Father, we uh, uh, pray that we'd be able to encourage others as well. So Father, here we are. Here's our hands. Father, we yield our lives to you for you to use us as you desire. Amen. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Thank you.
Bibles, if you will, please, and turn to Daniel chapter 1. And as you turn to Daniel chapter 1, let me give you a little quiz. You remember what Daniel's name means? You remember what Daniel's name means? God's my judge. Oh, well, you know, Ian, you, <laughs> my plan was is to tell everyone that I forgot to share that last week. So no one would know. And of course, would you know? Ian would know. <laughs> but anyhow, Daniel, it means God is my judge. You know, that is a fascinating thing to be aware of because Daniel, he was not really going to a Christian nation. In fact, complete opposite. But he recognized that God was his judge. Daniel chapter 1, let me start again with verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem to besiege it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to, to bring some of the people, some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youth without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate, and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, uh, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. You know, as we read the scripture, we need to be reminded always that scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, one of his current ministries, his ministries to us and in us are, are just a, a many, but one of his ministries, the Holy Spirit, one of his ministries is to illuminate our mind to the Word of God. Cause us to understand. And we do pray and ask the sweet Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see some amazing things out of his Word. Well, Daniel. Daniel and his world. This is what I chose to uh, describe this study this morning. We're going to have fun today uh, competing with the airplanes, aren't we? <laughs> so if we have to pause for a second or two, we will, but we're going to continue on. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, as we read through Scripture, we put the author or we put the, the individual like Daniel, we try to place him in our culture. You know, with, with our understanding. You know, we are at a place this week, if you haven't already, you know, this week we're going to have an election. There's going to be voting that takes place. And if you haven't voted, I, I hope that you will, as the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit directs you. But you know, we have this because we are in this country. We, the people of the United States. We have the right to vote, we have the right to speak our mind, we have the right to bear arms, we have so many rights and privileges as American citizens. And we even have the right and privilege to worship our God freely. Daniel did not. Daniel, he was uh, taken to this Babylonian country. Nebuchadnezzar was, was the leader. 
and they of anything they were completely antagonistic towards Jehovah God. They hated the things of God. They hated the culture of the Jewish people. They despised thinking that there was one God whom everyone must serve. And these, uh, these Babylonians, they were known for being vile and cruel and, and the way they would punish and torment those who did not agree with their religious system. It was horrendous. It was horrendous what they would do to people, just to torture them, just to get them to submit to the teachings of the Babylonians. Well, this was the day in which Daniel, this was the culture in which Daniel was called, he was placed, or he didn't have any choice in matter. They, he was taken captive. He and his friends, they were of the tribe of Judah, they were taken captive and thrown as young, probably middle-aged teenagers. 1517, they were taken and they were placed right in the middle of this ungodly perversion. This oppressive religious system. And it was there, at that place, they were told, they had the conviction that they were going to stand for the things of God in the middle of all that. Well, this leads us to a little bit of a discussion. What should our responsibility be in the midst of our culture? Daniel had his culture, and his name, as Ian said a little bit ago, his name means God is my judge. What is our response to culture? How should we as God's people conduct ourselves in the middle of the culture that we live in? And, of course, we all know that uh, it's not always as Christian as we would like it to be. And I'm not sure if it's ever really been Christian as much as we think it was. So what should we be? There's basically three things. This is the mindset that most uh, 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 Christian teachers and, and line of thinking as to how we as Christians should conduct ourselves in the culture in which we live. And I, I'm sharing these things because, because I want us to be aware and learn from Daniel how we can influence our culture. The first thought, there's three things. The first thought is Jesus is above culture. You have culture, you have mankind, you have all the beliefs, you have all the sin, sinfulness, you have all the administrations of the earth, and Jesus is above that. In other words, he doesn't really care about that. Just everyone's going to do what you want to do. Go ahead. That's fine. That's one. You, know, you have to keep the, the holy and the, the sacred and the ungodly separated. And God is so holy, he will not be a part of the culture. That's one line of thinking. And you have some people that, well, let's build us a little commune. And we'll separate ourselves so that there's only us. Only those who are like-minded. Let's, let's, let's build us a little city on top of a plateau, a mountain somewhere, and we'll have our own little Jerusalem up on the hill. And separate themselves totally from culture. Now, where Judy and I used to live, there was this uh, little group of people that they, they basically took over an entire subdivision. It was a cultish type. You know, they looked respectable. The kids were playing around and riding their bikes, and they lived in good two-story homes, you know, and it was a gated community, you know, and all that. But it was known as being where those ultra-separatists live. Well, there's, there's those that, you know, believe, well, Jesus is above culture. Therefore, we should in no way interact with the culture that we live. A little uncomfortable with that. And then there's the second thought. Jesus is against culture. In other words, you and I as God's people, no matter what, we should always be standing up against culture. We should always be confronting culture. We should always confront the evil and we should always fight against it. And no matter who's in office or no, no matter what the issue is of the day, we as Christians, you know, we preach the gospel and the gospel is offensive. So therefore, we must always be in a state of, of a conflict. And, and there are some Christian groups that if they don't have a good fight going on with someone in the culture, they're not serving the Lord. 
I mean, this is, this is the reality. Some, some Christian groups think that that's their calling. No matter what, if I don't have a fight, I'm going to find one somewhere. And then there's the third, and this is what I think the Bible teaches, that culture, it, it, it's described as this, Jesus transforming culture. Whereas we are the salt and the light. And God places us in our culture. God places us in our community. God places us in our towns because he wants us to be salt and light. We see, you know, Christians, we, there's, there's been a lot of discussion. How involved should we be with our culture? You know, um, for those, most here have had children. You know, what do we do with our children? How, how do we school our children? Do we homeschool? Do we send them to Christian school? Do we send them to public school? And even in kingdom families and kingdom congregations like ours, there's this, this, this stress that's taken place because we struggle with, okay, what are we to do with this? And, you know, uh, don't, don't read more into what I'm saying. I believe that all three at times are appropriate. I think there's a time where Christian schools are appropriate. There's a time where homeschooling is appropriate. And there's a time where public school is appropriate. And I, I know in saying that, I'm, um, you know, uh, I'm placing myself in a, in, a, in a place where a lot of Christians today would disagree. But we raised our kids in a public school. Had a wonderful experience. Um, there are those who home, most of all my kids homeschool their kids. I mean, so I, I think when it comes to those kinds of things, we need to understand that there's a little bit of flexibility in kingdom. And the, the scripture doesn't say absolutely, this is how you are to do it. And we try to grab at scriptures here and there trying to prove our point. But we, we need to understand that in this circle of that arena, there is a little bit of flex flexibility. And I think we need to learn in this area that we need to trust the Holy Spirit who guides mom and dad in the raising of their kids. I never question my kids when it comes to how they educate their kids. Now, if there are some things taking place, I would do it very kindly and graciously, I hope. But you know, we live in such a way as Christians today well, I believe God wants us to work and to conduct our life in our culture so that culture can be transformed. I think that is the biblical pattern. Before I move on, let me read this one passage from Jeremiah. I think it's very relevant for all of us today. Thus says Jeremiah 29, 4-9, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So Daniel, one of the um, one of the contemporaries of Daniel, he's dealing with this. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give, and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. And do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for it is wealth, it, it is, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. You see, what Jeremiah, in the same context, what he's telling them is that pray and live in such a way that your community, that you, you, the, the area, the, the subdivisions you live in, or the town that you live in, pray for its success. Pray for its peace. Pray for its well-being because in that community having success and well-being, your well-being is there too. So, what should our response be? I think, I think it's a good idea 
to have Christians in the political scene. I think it's a good idea to have Christian congressmen and women. I, I, I think it's a good idea to have a Christian Supreme Court justice. Humble but accurate opinion. I think it's a good idea to have Christians in a different community. There's one church in Chicago that I, um, I haven't heard anything about it in several years, but there was a time, you know, that, that area was just booming. And they were recognized that there, there are new subdivisions going in, and the, the church, you know, there's so many new people, they just couldn't keep up with them. They didn't have a representation in those different uh, subdivisions. So what they would do, it's a large church, very affluent church, they would pay the down payment on houses in one of these new communities if a Christian couple would agree to buy their house there. Trying to get the, the, the light of Jesus Christ in all of these communities. See, I like the, the, the concept behind that. No, we as a church, I don't think we're going to be able to do that this week. Okay? <laughs> But the concept is there. You know, um, I don't know what to think about trick or treating. Um, you know, we, we sat outside our house last night. We, we probably had about 10, 12, maybe a few more that came by. And do we believe in witches and ghosts and all that kind of stuff? Well, not the way they believe it. You know, we believe there's an evil world. Let me tell you what we did. We passed out Reese's. And we passed out Kit Kats. And we passed out malt balls. You know, those little, no, those are good. Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe we, uh, we still have some leftover, praise the Lord. <laughs> but you know what? We, we met some of our neighbors. Simply passing out candy. And you know, it's kind of fascinating because, you know, there's so much tense. There's political signs here and there, you know, and everyone's been confined to their homes, you know, and everything, everything is so uptight. And here, it was so refreshing to talk to and to meet people who were smiling and people who were having fun with their kids. And I had so much fun meeting some of my neighbors. I, I, I would tell everyone, Judy just starts, you know, shaking her head, you know. Like, uh, they, they, I'd give them the candy, and I'd say, remember, parents, the candy's for the kids. <laughs> Knowing very well that oftentimes we as parents have tendencies. I'm not sure if any of you. But I say all that because Daniel, Daniel was placed in a culture that was next to impossible to live for God. But yet, he thrived. With that in context, it's very important for us to understand that context because Daniel did not live in a culture like we where we can put a sign up and vocalize our opinion no matter what it is and most of the time not receive any repercussions from it. Well, notice first of all, Daniel chapter 2. Let's see here, where it is. There it is. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah, into his hand. Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now think about this. We recognize, we talked last week that Jehoiakim was not a really good guy. He's considered in the list of one of the evil kings. Okay. In fact, most of the kings were evil. Every once in a while, there would be a good king. But the Lord gave Jehoiakim King of Israel, God's chosen people, the people who were to be the representatives of the, to the entire world of the things of God. God gave them over to the evil, pagan, ungodly, messed up, abusive Babylonians. Well, that doesn't seem just. That's not fair. I mean, even the people of Israel, they were kinder and nicer than the Babylonians. Why in the, God, why in the world would God use these evil Babylonians to judge people or discipline a nation that was better than them? Huh. 
How, do, how, do, how does that work out? And therein, that places us right in the center of a dilemma that a prophet by the name of Habakkuk had. You're familiar with Habakkuk? I love the book of Habakkuk. If you want to sit down and, and read an entire book of the Bible in one sitting, that's good. It's only three chapters. <laughs> Some of my uh, friends from West Virginia, they used to call it Habakkuk. <laughs> Nellie, you're from West Virginia. Is, is that the way you grew up saying it? No? I know. You don't remember. <laughs> Habakkuk. The name of the prophet. You see, Habakkuk had this problem. He couldn't understand why God would use those people. God... Look who they are. Look at the evilness for centuries. Look how pagan and how evil and how perverted and how abusive. They worship all kinds of gods. They have a god for everything. They bow and they, they have temple prostitution. And they have all these kinds of stuff. And you're using them to discipline us. Every once in a while, we will deal with situations, you know, and we'll see some evil in our own society or in our own world. Kind of like um, this past week or two, some, I believe it was 20 Christians were persecuted and killed in North Korea for owning the Bible. What's that? Just 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 because they had a Bible. My goodness, I, I probably have 30 Bibles in my office. Probably have 30 more right here. Have access to who knows how many through Bible Hub. Not to mention the commentaries. And we wonder, what? What's going on? Well, Habakkuk had these questions. And it, it, contemporary of Daniel. They were all facing these things all at the same time. And this was Habakkuk's um, thought to God. I will take my stand, Habakkuk 2.1. I will take my stand at my watch, post and station myself on the tower, and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk had this question. You know, he was... He wasn't questioning God. He wasn't doubting God. He wasn't asking a question in such a way that, you know, God, you're a messed up God, so I'm just not going to worship you. He's saying, God, I know that you're a just and fair God. I know that you're good in all your ways. You always have been and you always will be, but I'm struggling with these questions. I'm struggling with how you could use this ungodly, messed up nation to judge people that I love dearly. He's struggling with this. He's saying, I'm just going to sit up on my little stand and, and God, I'm just going to wait. And I know you're going to give an answer. I, I, I know that your, your ways are good and just, but I just want to know what it is. I'm just going to wait and see. And shortly after that, that's chapter 2, verse 1. In chapter 4, this is what it says. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. Then there's this next part of this phrase. But the just shall live by faith. Have you heard that before? That's a proclamation in, in Romans, and I believe Galatians as well. And all of a sudden, um, you know, God, God is saying to Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. And he's saying, Habakkuk, there are some things in this life you claim, you claim to be just? You claim to be a follower of me? The just shall live by faith. You know what God is saying? Trust me. Trust me. Have you ever had one of those times where you're, you're wondering, you know, what, uh, I'm not sure what's taking place here. I'm not sure what's going on in my life. I'm not sure what's going on with my family member. It's just so many. I, I don't understand. You know what God is saying? The just shall live by faith. But you know, it didn't stop there. 
Habakkuk, he had um, a conclusion to his search for answers. This is what it is. The last few verses of chapter 3. I, love, I remember the first time I read this passage. Let me tell you where I was. Behind our, our barns, we had this 99-acre uh, field. I'm not sure why it wasn't 100 acres. It's a 99-acre field. And we were harvesting this corn. And we had these big uh, insulates wagons. We had chopped corn. You know, there was like 10 ton of, of chopped corn in each one of those things. And I'm, I'm just going across here, just minding my own business. And all of a sudden, a flat tire on that wagon with 10 ton of chopped insulin in it. And you know, it, it, it's not something you can just put a jack under. In fact, if you put a jack under, the jack will sink down into the ground because it's not going to lift that up. And with all kinds of other things taking place, I remember. And I, I had enough. I remember turning the tractor off shutting it down, grabbing my Bible, and I sat right up against that flat tire out in the middle of that field. And this is the passage that I read. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the, nor the fruit be on the vines, the, the produce of the olive oil, olive fail, and the fields yield no, no fruit. The flock be cut off from the fold. And there is no herd in the stall. Yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deers. He makes me tread on high places. There I was in the middle of that field, feeling totally defeated. There's a lot of other things that were going on too. Totally defeated. There's not a thing I can do about this. Sat there, not sure how long, but then I had a, an idea. Instead, it was one of these where it had a dual axle. It had two wheels that were kind of swiveling like this, you know. I'm thinking, okay. We need to try something new here. So I remember getting the shovel. And I dug a hole under the flat tire, and the other the tire, the dual axle, was holding it up. And I dug that hole deep enough to where I was able to take that flat tire off and roll it up to the barn to get it fixed. Man, just a few minutes before that, I mean, I was ready to cuss that thing out and holler and scream, scream and, and beat that wagon to death with my fist and everything else and a hammer. And none of you ever had any of those problems, I know. But the Lord taught me a lesson, and He's taught me many, many times since that. And even though there are no kernels of corn on the cob, and even though the cattle are sick, and even though I can't pay the light bill, and even though there's not enough money to buy heating oil for the furnace to, to heat my feet, I am still going to serve and worship my Lord. Amen. The just shall live by faith. See, all this, you have the prophet Daniel. You have the prophet Jeremiah. You had the prophet Habakkuk, all contemporaries that had a unique part of the, of the prophetic plan that God had for his people. All of them working together. And that was uh, one of his struggles. You know, I don't understand, you know, this, this Je Jehoiakim. The Lord gave Jehoiakim. Sometimes if the Lord gives something in your life, something that you are dependent upon, the Lord gives that, and you don't fully understand, just have a seat like Habakkuk. Take up your stand and wait on the Lord. He will renew your strength. Okay, that's the introduction. <laughs> well, seriously, one more point. One more point. Notice verse 2 again. 
And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. And some of the vessels of the house of God, he brought them to the land of Shinar. Hmm. The land of Shinar. Has anyone ever done some study on the land of Shinar? Isn't that a wonderful name? I live in the land of Shinar. That just sounds like a wonderful place to, to build your retirement home. The land of Shinar. Well, the land of Shinar, Nimrod, Nimrod and the city of Babylon are used interchangeably in the Old Testament. These three, these three cities, which is really the same one, used 280 times in the Bible. There's only one city mentioned in Scripture that's used more than this. Jerusalem. So what we have here is we have a conflict between Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the rule and reign of God, and we have the conflict of the land of Shinar, Bab Babylon, a Nimrod. Um, this uh, land of Shinar, it was the home, it was the focus of one of the messed up perversions of religious activity that was seeking to counterfeit God's plan. You've heard of Tower of Babel. You heard of uh, Nimrod, was it? The, the mighty warrior. Not a good thing. He was independent of God, seeking to establish himself in his own city and, and a new religious system that was contrary and counter to the things of God. Well, listen to what, uh, what uh, actually took place supposedly, in this, uh, this city that we're talking about. So, the chief uh, leader of this uh, city originally was Nimrod. I already mentioned that. He was married to um, a lady by the name of Tammuz. No, 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 that's not right. What was her name? Samarias. S-A-M-U-R-A-I-S. Samaria, Samarias. That was the wife of Nimrod. You say, well, well, Wendell, we're not connected here. We need to work on our communication here because I'm not sure where you're going with this. Well, this wife of Nimrod, she was the first high priestess of idolatry. Okay, well, I can see that, Wendell, but I'm still, what's the significance? She had a son named Tammuz. If you've done any uh, studies on Babylonian gods and you know uh, some of the Old Testament history, Tammuz is a name that you might be a little familiar with. But what's, what's significant about her son Tammuz? Legend had it that Samarias she, she was conceived, she conceived Tammuz in her womb by a beam of light, claiming a virgin birth. Okay, all right, well, no, that's new to me. Well, it goes on. Tammuz, her son, grew up and was killed by a wild boar. That's horrible. And after 40 days of weeping, legend has it that Tammuz was resurrected from the dead. I can tell that some of you are looking at me like, I'm not sure if I've ever heard this before. Go ahead, do your research. I'm fine. Check it out. And uh, we find that this is the beginning of the cultic worship called the mother and her child as identified in Jeremiah 44 verses 15 through 19. The mother and her child. So it doesn't stop there. So in order to celebrate this 
the supernatural resurrection. They started this uh, celebration of you know, life and fertility that focused in on an egg. They called it an Ishtar egg, meaning new life, from which we get Easter. Where are you going with all this? What I'm going in, uh, with all this is that Daniel was placed in the land of Shinar where there was all kinds of demonic activity seeking to replicate the supernatural activity of God. And the adversary from the very beginning has been seeking to counterfeit everything God does. Therefore, you have so many people that think that they can find joy and peace and contentment in this life apart from a relationship with God. And it is impossible. It is impossible. So, some of you are saying, well, should we stop celebrating Easter? No, 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 no. I'm not going to let the devil have the victory of that glorious day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, should we stop coloring Easter eggs? Oh, goodness, no. Like what my grandson says, it's several years ago, what's, what's the most favorite part of Easter that you like? And, you know, you know, I think he's going to say something. He said, I love Easter. Well, what's your favorite part of Easter? I'm thinking he was going to say the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No, he said, I love hard old eggs. <laughs> no, you know, the thing is, you, know, you can have the same argument about Christmas trees. It's a pagan symbol. No. No. You know, we live in a culture where so often there's a counterfeit taking place, but God overrules that counterfeit and brings glory to his name, even though the evil one seeks to disrupt the very things of God. I mean, you know, we have so many of these paganish titles and symbols that we have become so accustomed to, and we shouldn't be convicted about it. We should just recognize that, okay, that's not us. For example, Monday. Tomorrow's Monday. Where do we get the name Monday? Moon's Day. A lunar god. Tuesday. Where do we get the name Tuesday? Well, Mars Day. Is the, it was the god of an ancient Roman god of war. How about Wednesday? Mercury's day. I mean, it was a god when, when uh, the commerce would uh, take place. It, was, it had a pagan uh, the beginnings. How about Thursday? Jupiter's day. You know, the, the Thor's day. You know, it, it means it, there's, it comes from a Greek god. How about Friday? It speaks of Venus's day. It's uh, the god of home and marriage and fertility. Then there's Saturday, the god of fun and feasting. You know, so we, we have all these titles, but you know, over time they have been, they come in, we just Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, we, we live it and we enjoy it, you know, we, we celebrate it but we don't accept the original meaning of it. So we as Christians, and this is why I think it's important and why I, you know, I think it was impressed upon my heart, is that we live in our culture. We, Daniel lived in his culture. And, in, and there are some things, you know, Jesus, you know, the, the old saying is that Jesus sat with sinners, he didn't sin with sinners. Okay, there's a big difference. We... Just as Daniel, recognizing that God is their judge, we have been placed in this culture, and God's intention for us is to transform that culture through the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace of God. You know, I, you know, we need. Don't 
be surprised if you have some neighbors who don't talk like Christians. And you guys might be a little surprised. <laughs> I mean, maybe some of them don't talk about Christians too, and if that, we don't want to hear about that. But you know, don't be surprised for those of us who don't live in that, uh, that heaven on earth place there. Uh, don't be surprised if you don't hear your neighbors say, saying some foul things. Don't be surprised if you don't have some co-workers that tell some foul jokes. Don't be surprised if you don't have people in your life that aren't Christian. There's someone that I know, um, someone pretty close to us, that uh, posted something on Facebook about loving and caring and being kind to people and using words, you know, graciously. And I was told how this person has a co-worker that responded to that and said to the person that posted it, I have found no one who lives this out more than you. And because you live this out, it makes me want to be more like Jesus. You see, that's living in a culture, that's working in a culture, that's conducting yourself in a culture and making sure that you are used by God to transform your culture. You say, well, well, Wendell, I, I'm pretty much past the age of transforming culture. I'm, I'm almost 45. Well, 50, well, 60, whatever age you might be. Know this, that every single one of us, if we are still here, God intends to use us in that process of transforming culture, the culture that we can live in. I think today, one of the greatest things we can do is to be kind. Is to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what if my neighbor has a political sign up that's different than, than my perspective? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what if my neighbors are, are non-Christian and they, they worship Allah? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what if my neighbor has a different um, perspective on marriage? Love your neighbor as yourself. There's something about that love and, you know, and, and you, you love people and you care for people. And don't be surprised if they don't ask you for the reason of the hope that lies within you. You know, I think that sometimes we think our perspective is, you know, people winning them to Christ, we have to grab them and slap them. Love Jesus, come on now, surrender your life to Jesus. <coughs> love your neighbor. As yourself. One of the greatest tools, if you will, and it's so refreshing, one of the greatest tools we have in, I would say, arsenal, that's not a really good word to use there, one of the greatest tools available to us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Loving people into the now, as you love them, they will know. And my neighbors, they, they know I'm a pastor. You know, my neighbors, they, they, they know we're Christians, you know. But, you know, when they need someone to pray for them, they know where to go. And, lo and behold, I, I get to the place where, you know, I'm not sure if I want to witness to my neighbors anymore. I, I've witnessed to our neighbors over the last 14 years here. We've had several of them start coming to church, you know, and, and they, they get, you know, excited about the Lord. They serve, and then the Lord moves them to another town. I'm tired of losing neighbors. I'm not going to love them anymore. <laughs> you know, but uh, you love them, and what happens is that God plants seed in there in them. And if they do go to another church, or if they do go to another town, you know that you've had a part in kingdom work. Daniel, he was placed in his culture, and so are we. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this uh, time we can study scripture. 
and we can look at things that uh, pertain to Daniel. Lord, I have a good idea that we shared some things today that really um, some of us are going to want to dig a little deeper in. And there's uh, some amazing things. Lord, teach us. Help us to, to meditate on it, ruminate on it, to really get all the nourishment out of every word that is, is in your special uh, scripture. Father, teach us continually throughout the week. Father, now we commit this service and this time to you and for your glory. In Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Now remember the